Good morning. Good morning, good morning. And how are you? Well, the gods have aligned and I happen to be in the right car with the right equipment to record a video. Let's just make sure I've got the correct visibility through the windscreen before I start driving. Lovely. <clears throat> it's February 2nd as you can see and the atmosphere is spring-like. We're going to have a very nice plume of warm weather coming up from the southwest which is going to push the temperatures up to 14 degrees in some areas. So great. Oh. I've uh, finally uh, I've got a bit of woodland on my property and we use the wood to heat the house uh, which is carbon neutral right because I grew the trees and now I'm burning the trees so I captured the carbon now I'm releasing the carbon carbon neutral right so I finally found out what's the best way to uh, uh, to do it, you know, I mean, you know, we're always learning, I'm learning, learning our entire lives. So after 20 years of living in this house, and I planted some ash trees, when I, you know, after about three or four years I've been there, I planted the ash trees, or one or two. Uh, anyway, uh, hello, you see, you shouldn't be allowed down here. Your track, you are more than half the width of the road. You should be banged. Because what happens if he meets a truck, the same truck coming the other way? What are they going to do? They're going to have to go all over the verge, aren't they? Or up someone's drive. Or Anyway, <clears throat> here's the trick. What you do is, people tend to think of trees as things that are always there, you know? They never change. Sometimes if you go back and visit the area where you grew up, you think, oh, it doesn't quite look the same because the trees are bigger. But uh, most of the time, you know, a tree is a tree is a tree. But in fact, that's one thing I've learned. If you want to, if you're, let's say, you're in your 40s or your 50s or even in your 60s and you think you'd like a tree somewhere, if you plant it, it will grow to an appreciable size in your lifetime. So if you want a tree somewhere, plant it, and then, and then eventually you will see a tree somewhere. I mean, you know, it'll be a couple of decades later probably. But when I, uh, uh, <laughs> when I bought the house, I planted a few Christmas trees because I thought they'd be useful, and uh, I thought I've got you know something to plant them. I might as well grow my own rather than buy them. And these things are about sixty foot tall now. Scott's Pine. So, you know, I've got to, I've got to cut them down. They're getting to the point where I'm going to pr pretty well. I'm going to need a tree surgeon to come down if I don't watch out. Anyway, let me try and get a bit of heat on the windscreen so we don't fog up. That's good. So. Um, What you do is, I planted about 100 ash trees. And you cut all the lower branches off so they grow up single stem. And then when you can't get your hands around them, that's the time to cut them down. And then you can cut them down and they just go straight into logs. And they burn straight away, you don't have to wait for them to dry out. I mean, you can do, but... The only trouble is, obviously, the ash die back. Uh, and, uh, but funnily enough, you know, I mean, if you leave the tree standing, they will get into a right state once they've died off. But if you just catch them like a year or two after they've died, they're pretty well uh, seasoned themselves standing up. So you can cut them down at that point and then your logs will be dry as anything. Um, and I've got, as I say, I planted a hundred trees. And as soon as this ash dieback came into the country, everyone was like, oh yeah, we're gonna lose all the ash trees, blah, blah, blah. Well, I can say, just a guess, I would say, out of 100 trees, I probably had uh, 
20 affected so far. The rest of them are growing quite fine, you know. So whether or not they've got a bit of an immunity or whether it just is, takes, you know, I mean, but some of them are completely unaffected, so I don't know. Certainly, I'm, I've got more wood than I know what to do with. I mean, just cutting down the ash trees, I've got enough wood to heat the house. If I was to cut down one of the Scots pines, I'd have enough to heat the house for, uh, you know, the rest of my life. You can't really burn Scots pine because it gives off a sticky resin that evaporates and coats the inside of your chimney and the next thing you know, you've got a Roman candle coming out the top of your chimney. So I don't know what I'll do with that wood. Um, so dentally, that's what you're interested in. You're not interested in. Actually, no, let me just tell you quickly. So what you do is, birthday present I got, a Christmas present, I got a dual fuel petrol can. So it's got petrol, which you mix with uh, two stroke oil in one compartment and chainsaw oil in the other compartment and uh, you, uh, you go out and uh, you need a wheelbarrow, your chainsaw of course, uh, this thing this thing which carries the tool as well as well as the petrol to adjust the chain tension um, and then most importantly a thermos full of coffee so that whenever you've done a bit of chainsaw and you can sit down and admire your handiwork and have a half a cup of coffee. Yeah, so that's it. I mean, you can easily sling those in a wheelbarrow and go out and come back with a week's worth of wood, you know, in a couple of hours. Very satisfying. And good for your fitness as well. I mean, you're, uh, you, you're working your upper body when you... Uh, slinging the chainsaw around, you're uh, lifting, you know, you're doing deadlifting, you're, uh, and also you're with a wheelbarrow full of wood, I mean you might have like, I don't know, two, three hundred weight, you're going a bit fast matey, two or three hundred weight of wood in the wheelbarrow, and you've got to yomp it over rough turf, uh, say 100, 150 yards, and then unload it all, as well as loading it up. So, you know, you feel like you've done a little bit of exercise when you come in. Dentistry wise, we are, we're making enough money. We're not really working much. I've got to be honest, I mean, I've worked two and a half days this week. I worked Monday, Wednesday, and I'm now going into work Friday morning. So, I can't say I'm killing myself, but you know, it's going to be, it's quite funny because our lovely receptionist Eddie left, she's gone to work for Border Force, this is the, Border Force is a pain in these Ken, because they're starting, you know, they start people off at £30,000 a year, and local businesses just can't compete with that, I mean they can take on as many people as they like, using public funds and you know I'm having to pay for that and also I can't get the staff so see all the hedges have been trimmed around here you can see all the broken and smashed ends of the hedges where they've trimmed them all back so uh, anyway so she left yesterday uh, well Wednesday last day in January I mean Technically, she's supposed to work till today, the 2nd of February. But I said to her, be honestly, you know, I'd rather, for the sake of ease of the payroll, I'd rather you finish on the 31st of January, because then that's a complete month, isn't it? And then I don't have two days of February outstanding. I'd have to then wait until the end of February to do the final payroll and everything. So. <sighs> anyway, the... Uh, Staff have got a 2% decrease in their national insurance starting this month. But I've looked at my what I call the total cost of ownership of each member of staff and that's gone up. 
So in fact, the the way they wangle it is that they've um, they given the staff uh, another hundred quid more, and then and then ended up with the employers paying more than that back. So it's hardly a tax cut. It's a tax increase to the government and a massive increase to employers and a small cut to the employees. So I'd encourage you to do that. If you do do your own uh, wages on a spreadsheet, just add up everything that it costs to employ someone. Add up, add up their wages. Add up their... <coughs> Add up their um, employer's national insurance and add up the employer's pension contribution. And that gives you a total cost of ownership. What you can do is you can, you know, I mean, although technically it's on the employee's payroll uh, pay slip, you can actually include the employer, employee's tax and national insurance and the employee's pension contribution. Um, and then you, that gives you a very bold figure of what exactly the employee is getting out of the relationship and what the government's getting out of the relationship. I don't know what the nominal tax rate will be if you, if you did that sum. Very high, I'd imagine. Because although the, uh, you know, they say that the employee pays, for example, their tax, they don't. The employer pays the tax to the national, to the BAYE, HMRC. So you have to you have to give it to the employee so that they can pay it to the HMRC. So it's you that has to stump it up. Do you know what I mean? It's you that has to find it every month when it goes up and down, and, and you're responsible for making sure that you give them the right amount so that they can pay it back to you to pay to HMRC. So we went through a recruiting process. We used Indeed, uh, and that was very good. We got 50 reasonable quality candidates, and some, I'd say, a dozen really high quality candidates, and uh, it cost 24 quid. And that was for the uh, recru recruiting process over a month. Uh, so I was very happy with that. And we got a very good candidate currently a practice manager, receptionist, sort of head receptionist, stroke, nurse trainer, troubleshooter, CQC Im implementer, etc, etc. So, and she's coming from this, this most appalling practice, which is a corporate. Well, when I say a corporate, it's, yeah, it's like a quasi-corporate. It's just a single dentist that's been penny pension enough and tight enough and ruthless enough to amass a, a corporate chain of about six practices which they you know they got by but I mean it's not mince words by just being a complete arsehole um, and uh, that's what you do that's how you do it you cut corners I mean and I'm not just this is not sour grapes I mean I'm they, they cut corners to the point where they have no um, toilet roll in the in the place, and so the staff say to the boss, "Can we have toilet roll?" And he says, "Yeah, of course. Yeah, don't don't think you can't ask me for toilet roll." But then then it, you know it takes three months to get the toilet roll, or or they buy the toilet roll and put in the claim and for expenses, and then it's three months before the the toilet roll is paid for. So what they've done is, in the end, all the staff, the senior staff, have actually just had to resort to going out and buying their own toilet roll. Not just for them, but for the practice, you know. So the practice toilet roll is paid for by the staff. That's just another example of, you know when I said things can't get, you think things can't get any worse, and then they do, you know. You think a bridge is a apartment pontic abutment, and then you start seeing abutment pontics. It's just things can always get worse. 
that song that Labour had, things can only get better. That's not true. <laughs> things can always get worse. So anyway, we've got a gap between, because this new uh, lady can't start till the 16th or something. We've asked Ellie to leave on the 31st, so me and the angry nurse are on our own for a couple of weeks. But like I say, we're not, you know, we're not that bothered. We can easily do checkups and I mean, even crown preps and stuff like that. As long as she's got enough time to reset the surgery in between patients. And then as far as the um, reception goes, um, you know, I can do reception. I can dial into the work computer from home. And this morning I actually did that. I did just that. I uh, was ready to leave about uh, 8 o'clock, quarter to 8, and so I sat down at the home computer dialed into the work computer, answered all the emails, um, cancelled an appointment from someone who hadn't, you know, has got a history of not paying their invoice, was due in on Monday and was due to pay for their checkup appointment by 5 p.m. yesterday, hadn't paid again, so had got their, their Monday appointment cancelled again. Then I've got this uh, patients contact me on Google business, which I wish they would because it really is a, you know, I mean, you know, you can only have so many communication channels. Do you know what I mean? But okay, fine. You get this message from Google. Someone's contacted you through your business profile. Why anyone would want their personal affairs to be broadcast all over Google, I don't know, but my name, blah, 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 can I get an emergency appointment, please? My tooth is hurting, etc. And we have this standard response that says, yes, to make an appointment, please click on this link. And the link takes them to a Google spreadsheet where they can enter just basic information like their name, date of birth, telephone number, um, what, what, you know, there seems to be the problem. Uh, whether they want an appointment morning or afternoon and, and what days are good and what days are bad, you know? Oh, I should have done that. I'll go now. That's just as cheeky. So, so, have they clicked on that link? No. <coughs> Having disturbed me like at eight o'clock last night and got a reply within probably 10 minutes they haven't clicked on the link and so any chance of them coming in today Friday morning which is the last day I'll be working this week is gone they'll have to come in next week now and then Google have got this you know the cheat to write and say you know you must reply quickly this is your average response time, blah, blah, blah. And you have responded to 88% of inquiries, but anyone who responds to less than 90% uh, 90 may be uh, you know, banned from using this facility. I mean, I wouldn't mind being banned from using their facility. They're a pain in the doodah. Why can't people just... Uh, click on the link and send us an email through the website in the normal way. You've only got to go to my website and click on the thing that says book. So I don't know why they're asking if it's possible. It's like it's like going to a website of someone that, of a builder who says we build extensions and then clicking and saying I wonder if you can build me an extension. So perhaps I'll ask to get banned. Or perhaps I'll just disconnect it, you know. Anyway, you know, this is my problem. This is my problem. I worry about these people. I shouldn't worry about them. And all these people have got toothache, they've had it for years. They've been to NHS dentists, they've mucked up their teeth, and they come to see me. 
I don't, I don't have to worry about. I do worry about the system overall. Just me and Kevin Lewis had a bit of a conversation lately over the resurgence of the voucher system or granting aid. And uh, we both care about dentistry and dental treatment provision systems and whether the thing's working well or badly. And I have a big grudge against the Department of Health because when I qualified, I, I could help people, you know. I could help children, I could help old people who wanted full dentures on the NHS. I could do crimes on the NHS. I did bridges on the NHS, did a lot of good bridges on the NHS. And, uh, and they changed the system and changed it and kept changing it and kept making it worse and worse and worse to the point where I couldn't, you know, I can't even get an NHS contract now. I can't, I can't help anyone of, of that, that group who really needs help. I'm restricted to people who got the financial wherewithal to be able to afford my services. And uh, you, you can't help anyone who doesn't have the financial wherewithal. What happens is the people who don't rely on the state to um, pay for their treatment. Uh, without even the state paying for their treatment, there's nothing I can do. What can I do? I cannot get an NHS contract. And even if I got an NHS contract, you know, for example, if if they said to me, yes, Derek, we'll contract you to do a thousand fillings on the thousand most needy people in your area, and I'd say, great, you know, what's, what, what am I going to get reimbursed for that? And they'll say, five pound of filling or 10 pound of filling or something, or even 20 pound of filling, you know, considering I privately I charge 143 pound of filling, and they're gonna say 20 pound or 30 pound of filling or something, or even less. They might say as many fillings as they need for 100 quid or something. And it's precisely uh, the, this mentality of, you know, the, the dentists who do take up this sort of contract. So I've got this thinking that they're, they're going to make a loss on every patient but then that won't matter because of the volume of patients that will come in and they don't quite understand why that doesn't work. So that is uh, Treatment Provision Systems 101. If you remember anything from this what I've said today apart from how to brilliantly hit your house for nothing just remember, you, the money comes first. It's all very well saying, oh, I, you know, you, you contracted me to treat a thousand patients and I've done that within the budget, but another 500 needed seeing, so I've seen those as well. So could I have some extra money? The answer to that is no. You know, you, you do what you're paid for. You can't, I mean, you can on a pro bono basis. Do work. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do charitable work, but on the other hand, even that has to be paid for. You know, someone has to pay for the materials to start, the rent. It's uh, even if it's you know working on the NHS and cross subsidising it from the private work. But um, that that's gone on within the dental profession for a long time, and I don't think that's a good idea. I honestly, don't. You know, I mean, why give, why give someone a service that, and charge them less than it costs to provide by overcharging for another service that you provide? It just doesn't make sense. Anyway, bit of a ramble today. Sorry about that, but at least it's a video. You know, you got one. What are you asking? You don't pay anything for this, you know. Just do, you know, if you don't like what you're getting, just contact YouTube and ask for a refund. All right? Okay. See you soon. Bye.